invitation to talk to you tonight. I think what is just important is that I will be talking a little bit outside the NetCare environment and sharing with you what is happening in the rest of the country on um, the COVID uh, sphere and in the COVID uh, area. I just want to make sure my slides want to move. It's one of those glitches that don't want to. I'm just going to stop share and share again. So uh, I will give an overview of the national search strategy approach. The challenges that we in the Ministerial Advisory Committee is facing with oxygen and then share some lessons learned in the field hospital environment. So a wild spectrum of aspects, but all related to our current COVID situation. Now, I think for a lot of you, the biggest question is, what are we expecting? Is this over? Uh, are we really in the plateau? Is this just a temporary lapse in the cases? Uh, let's look at some of the modeling figures. This is still the official modeling graph for South Africa, and it is about a week old. And you can see that we're still expecting a peak of just, just over uh, 740,000 cases with a possibility of going up to approximately 800,000 cases in end of August, beginning of September. So there is still a way to go with COVID in this country. The worrying picture is this one, highlighting the cumulative detected cases. And here you can see that it is envisaged that we will keep on rising and peak with the total cumulative cases in December, over 3 million cases. So that gives you a picture of what is happening in the country and what is the challenges that we face within the country. This is broken down into what will be required mainly in hospital beds and then very specifically in critical care beds. This is the graph for all the different provinces of the country and the peak number of hospital beds that is envisaged they will require in the peak of the pandemic in their specific province. I think the important one to be on the lookout for is KZN. Um, how Teng is just at that level. It is expected that KZN is going to exceed Gauteng and the numbers is already increasing and peak in September, uh, in the middle of September. Looking at the other provinces is looking more, uh, a little bit more better, uh, better, but critical is the Western Cape approach, which was a very unique approach and nobody can explain that at the current moment is that the Western Cape peaked much lower, but with a much wider uh, graph. So they, they are getting patients for a much longer period of time in large numbers. This is expected or required hospital beds. This is the expected critical care beds. And it is in this area which we are really very, very concerned and that we're monitoring the situation very closely on a daily basis. Uh, there's this dif different demographics per province, taking into consideration how many patients will require critical care. And you could see the peak of Gauteng right up here at nearly 1,500 critical care patients expected. And we are really, really seeing that currently. And I think you're feeling it in the hospitals in Gauteng, in the other provinces, KZN, it is really also a very large number of patients that is expected. Which areas of the country? This is the official hotspot map uh, of yesterday. And you can see which uh, districts in the country has got the highest number of COVID positive cases. Very interesting is the central part of the country over here. Uh, Western Cape area, the bottom of Northern Cape, and then the, the top part of the Eastern Cape. 
then this corridor down here, down the, the highway routes in that direction, and then you could see the spots in the other areas. Also look in this area over here, which is the East London corridor up to Oliver North, and you see the high number of positive cases in those areas. This is the official estimates per province in the country, uh, plus the date which is expected that that province will peak and the total numbers that we envisage will, will peak and then the number of hospital beds required, 54,000, and just over 10,000 critical care beds. Now, I think for all of you on the call, just to, to bring this into perspective, we don't have nearly this number of beds in the country available, and this is really the most challenging aspect. Uh, luckily, it's lower than what we envisaged originally, uh, the or initial assessment indicated about 17,000. Currently, with the current case rates, it's down to about 10,000. Um, we don't uh, have more than 700 ICU beds officially in the country. So that gives you a good indicator of the challenge that we are facing countrywide with planning for COVID. Now, to address this, believe it or not, there is a national search strategy on how to address this and addressing, first of all, a plan for the country with measures on care pathways and the infection prevention and control measures, but then very importantly, a search strategy addressing the facility utilization strategy principles and then the alignment of the various components in the country to address this situation. The contents of this search strategy can be summarized in the six uh, bullets that are visible on the screen. The first very important aspect is to meet the requirement of that number of hospital beds. We need to utilize all hospital facilities in the country, public and private, to address the needs. The original guideline to all the hospitals was to plan and prepare for 80% of all hospital beds to be made available for COVID. Um, I think we can all realize the challenge in that statement, but that is based on the required number of beds, leaving us only with 20% of beds for trauma and the rest of the emergency cases. Currently, that has been adapted to a 65 to 85% ratio, depending on the capacity in the area. And we are addressing this currently in quite a few of the government hospitals to achieve this. And I know that quite a few of the private hospitals are even exceeding this number of um, COVID cases at the moment. Then a critical point is that we group ICU and high care together as critical care facilities with the guideline given to both private and public that 100% of all critical care beds need to be planned and prepared. Please note the term planned and prepared, the same with hospital beds, activated only when it is really required. But we must plan how we're going to use them and ensure that we are prepared for this. A request was then issued by the Director General of Health to all the provinces and to the private hospital groups to try and double their capacity um, in by decanting other spaces in the hospitals to make provision for managing critical care patients. Please note that we're not talking about ventilated patients. We're talking about critical care patients. So this includes high flow nasal oxygen and the CPAP uh, patients. Day hospitals are not utilized. Then critical point that we uh, try and, and encourage all hospitals to calculate their surge capacity um, on how many patients they can accommodate additionally to the current bed load of that hospital. Therefore, the hospitals are requested to calculate their surge capacity and this refers to areas within the hospital 
which is not currently patient bearing, but can be converted to manage patients. This is really to try and have a buffer available for the enormous possibility of a, a, a second wave and all the risks that comes with that. There are regulatory challenges with you in the private sector for this, and most of the provinces have issued a um, instruction to waiver the, the, the uh, ceiling on hospital beds for this purpose. Then we go to temporary facilities and we'll spend a little bit of time tonight on temporary facilities. We try to encourage the hospitals to go for additional facilities on site. And we see this by placing additional buildings currently at various hospitals, mainly hospitals in the rural areas, which is already have a very high bed occupancy uh, figure and then providing them with additional wards in temporary buildings. Then some standalone facilities by converting other buildings and then the mass care facilities, which I think a lot of us have seen on TV and I'll talk on a few of those tonight. Critical of the mass care facilities, um, they are not really economically benefiting the country. They're costing a lot of money and they're, at the end there's not really a benefit for the health system. So we try and keep those only in the, in the metropolitan areas where the search indicates that we need these additional hospital beds. This whole process is then coordinated centrally uh, and monitored centrally and decentralized execution within the provinces. I think NetCare is a unique example of this, where you have your gold command structure, monitoring it centrally, but then within your regions, there are execution of the guidelines given. On this slide is really the total concept that South Africa is utilizing at the current moment. And that is a complete surveillance and epidemiological analysis, which is ongoing, identifying number of cases and identifying when they will reach the hospital. This is then compared with the bed occupancy monitoring, and there's an ongoing process to monitor this. This feeds into the current hospital beds. The moment that these two indicators start showing that the current hospital beds are not adequate, we go for synchronized decanting. And I emphasize the word synchronized here, this is instructing hospitals to decant patients when needed in areas we needed. I think one of the big mistakes that was made in the country's management of COVID is that they started decanting way too early, resulting in a backlog now in elective work that should have been addressed in the process and could have continued unhindered until very recently. Then we look at the surge capacity within the hospital complex, then we look at additional temporary facilities, converted buildings, and then mass care facilities. All of these have got lead times uh, attached to them, and we uh, concentrate on a comprehensive planning per geographical area to go all the way down if necessary and activate the various levels as required. Uh, by the bed occupancy numbers and the positive case numbers. These are examples of surge capacity. This is Livingston Hospital in Port Elizabeth, where the parking area was converted into a patient carrying capability. Uh, luckily, this facility was built as a surge capacity. And you see here in the pillars of the parking area, oxygen suction and medical air outlets. So it was very easy to convert this in a very short period of time into a very effective uh, care capability. This is the parking area of Universitas Hospital in Bloemfontein, right next to uh, the NetCare facility. And this parking area has now been converted into a ward ready to receive patients. This is the recreation hall facility that are converted into a high care unit with piped oxygen for the purpose. And this process has been done at various hospitals, various nurses homes, uh, right throughout the country to achieve additional beds and additional high care capabilities. These units are really unique as they are designed units 
with gas outlets and power outlets linked to an overhead supply. In this specific high care facility, um, this is the close view of the units that are uh, made for, uh, built for the purpose. And in this specific unit, they are utilizing Lazy Boy chairs for the patients. I'm waiting to hear the reports on the effectiveness thereof. And this is the premier of the Free State opening the facility. I hope they don't take blood pressure like that in the Free State, but that was just an interesting picture. Now, that brings us to the second challenge. First challenge being beds and bed occupancy and available number of beds. Automatically with beds go staff, and we can talk another hour on staff, but let's focus a little bit on the oxygen challenges and what is ahead of us or what is currently hitting us on the oxygen environment. Uh, I think for us in the hospital environment, we normally write over here and we just expect the oxygen to come out of the wall or the cylinder be connected and we can administer oxygen. We never worry about this pathway down here. It was only when this total pathway as a supply chain was analyzed from the air separation unit through the depots, transport, oxygen storage, and then the supply equipment to the patients that we realized the challenges that we're facing in the country with oxygen. Um, this is the forecast for oxygen in the country. The yellow line at the bottom is the normal average medical use of medical oxygen in the country. We already exceeded that in July. And here you can see the peak, which is predicted for August of 1,449 tons of oxygen required and then slowly scaling down to December. But this is what we normally use. This is what we require currently based on COVID. How are we going to address this? We can increase the supply of medical oxygen to that level, but we cannot reach this level of oxygen that is required to supply all our hospitals. So the only alternative is to look at industrial oxygen, which are manufactured for the steel factories and utilized in all the steel plants. And we now feeding this industrial oxygen into the system to provide us with additional oxygen. There is not a big difference between industrial oxygen and medical oxygen. It just goes through a scrubbing process a little bit more to get to medical oxygen but currently the plants are, uh, are, are channeling this extra supply into more scrubbers and to provide us with this oxygen level, which is over there. Still predicted that we're going to have a challenge in, in this month and most probably also in September. How are we addressing this? Basically through a threefold approach. First of all, the medical oxygen which you already know about, then the industrial supply of oxygen, channeling that from the steel factories to the hospitals, and this is a balancing act between daily use and the production in the steel factories, then increasing the delivery process by the companies to the hospitals by tripling the routes for the, the oxygen trucks and offloading more oxygen more frequently at all, all the hospitals. And it's only through this combination of processes that we can utilize or we can reach this peak. The challenging situation is currently cylinders and we've got an acute shortage of cylinders in the country currently. We're busy converting nitrogen uh, cylinders into oxygen cylinders and industrial oxygen cylinders into medical oxygen cylinders. So it's really an urge to all of us to make sure that there's no empty cylinders lying at any of the hospitals. And if there are any, get them to the suppliers as quick as possible. At the current moment, up in the northern part of the Eastern Cape, we're running out of oxygen because all those hospitals run on cylinders and there are not enough cylinders anymore to supply this. There's a lot of our EMS colleagues on the call. So addressing the oxygen supply within the EMS has also been addressed. 
and we we really um, uh, blocking the delivery of the 1.84 kilogram cylinders to hospitals so that the EMS can have access to that size cylinders for the EMS uh, environment and keep the EMS uh, going. This is just an interesting graph showing the increase in the use of oxygen in the country in the rolling seven days. This starts in May and you can see how we now have got a continuous increase in the use of oxygen in the country. So where this is going to, we don't know, but this needs to be monitored very carefully and require a lot of planning and a lot of intervention. One of the biggest challenges is the delivery by the different companies of oxygen to the hospitals. Within the country, we only got 36 trucks that can transport liquid oxygen. So if any of those trucks get unserviceable, it reflects directly back on supplies to the hospitals and challenges. So that is a national asset that we're really protecting and guarding at the current moment. The second part is then the need for cylinders to be returned as quick as possible to be refilled. This is the Western Cape's oxygen use, and you could see that that is slowly now reaching a plateau. We're hoping that this is the end of the peak in the Western Cape, uh, the Ministerial Advisory Committee made certain decisions on Tuesday night on the lockdown. And we think that if the lockdown uh, restrictions is lifted, we may see more patients again. And uh, there's also other measures, uh, possibilities resulting in a second wave, which may follow on this wave and go into a New York type of scenario. Then moving on to the field hospitals, and I think this is an area where a lot of the colleagues on the call don't know much about, and therefore I decided to take the, the Volkswagen Field Hospital in Port Elizabeth as a case study just to highlight to you the challenges of setting up these temporary facilities for COVID patients in this environment, and what should we think of, and what have we forgotten about in this process. Now, the Volkswagen facility in Port Elizabeth is one of the facilities created in the, in the, let's say, the worst facility. It's a mass care facility being pitched into an empty factory from Volkswagen, and this factory um, is now being converted into a hospital for patient care. The other mass care facilities in the country are mostly in exhibition centers, which are far better suited for the purpose than this facility. So that's why I chose this one as the case study, just to highlight some of the challenges that we are facing in this process. This is the layout of this facility, and I don't expect you to see all of this, but it is, it is planned in phases. This is phase one, which is currently operational. This is phase two, and right at the back is a phase three, which can be activated if required. This current facility, as we see it here, gives us an access to 1,700 beds, and we think that this is sufficient at the current moment, so the, the construction of this part is not going ahead at the moment. So important here, balancing bed occupancy, case numbers with available beds to make these decisions. What lessons have we learned from using this facility? First of all, if you're using a warehouse, it needs to be properly cleaned. Our big challenge in this facility is the roof trusses overhead, where they, they, they were cleaned and washed down, but there are uh, now debris falling from them down on the patients, and now everybody believe the place is haunted, and they're expecting the ghosts from the ceiling to come down on them. It's really just a basic cleaning process, which is impossible after you moved into it. Then very importantly, whenever you plan such a facility, map it very, very carefully and map it in colors. Red for the isolation area, the yellow uh, decontamination area, and then the support area. And it's only if you map this that you find the mistakes and the challenges. The routes that must be followed through the facility must be clearly identified, drawn, marked out, and then only do you find 
the challenges and the contamination points. We were not involved in the design of this facility. We only got involved when it started to become operational and we had to retrofit the, the challenges to correct that. That could have been prevented by proper planning and drawing the flows of patients through the facility. If you look at the Cape Town International um, Convention Center, they have really drawn their flows very carefully through the process and did not have a lot of problems with cross flows and contamination. Be careful of the amount of entrances and exits. We have the challenge of staff flowing in, not going through a, a doffing donning area and flowing out of the facility if there are too many open doors. Patients wandering off, family picking up patients and patients disappearing. This looks ridiculous. It happened to us in Sierra Leone. I was the government's representative in Sierra Leone for the Ebola outbreak, where we had an active run on the hospitals to get PPE by the community to protect them. So this is critical to have your entrances controlled so that you don't have a situation like this happening at any hospital in the country. This was the out the way we received, and you could see here the direct link between personnel, support, kitchen, etc., and red isolation area. A lot of contamination took place here, and therefore we had to establish a yellow zone separating the two, going through decontamination, and then only into green, coming out, transiting, and then into the red isolation area. And it was only when we implemented this measures there that we could address the cross-contamination that was happening. Just a quick visual tour do, through the facility, highlighting again challenges that there are to learn from this type of facility whenever we need to do this or create additional space at any of our hospitals. Admission reception standard, not really any challenges with that process. Then we had an assessment area of 48 beds for patients arriving at the facility to be evaluated, tested, and admitted or discharged or referred higher to um, uh, proper intensive care facilities. This is what the facility looks like and the layout thereof. Challenge is it was designed to have standard hospital beds, which was not suitable for the purpose and then base beds, which I'll talk about a little bit more, that was not really suitable for the purpose. The use of full linen, et cetera, in a facility like this for assessment is also not recommended. So we had to change this to address the needs. Critical uh, that you need to plan for emergency equipment at these facilities. This hospital was originally designed that all patients will be referred only to this from other hospitals. The moment the public start hearing about this hospital and they know the conditions in the government hospitals, they rushed off with the uh, uh, family members to this facility, gasping at the door and screaming for help. So you need to be ready to receive unplanned patients at the facility. What have we learned? Plan for unforeseen arrivals, gasping at the door. Plan for emergency care. You may think that you only got a low care facility, but then you need to be ready to intubate with all the protective measures needed for that and then to transfer the patients. Patients' possessions is a big challenge. The patients arrive with a truckload full of possessions and they come by an ambulance with all of this and now it must be accommodated. Where do you go to with it? Is it contaminated? Can you give it out afterwards? Are you transmitting the disease? Measures needed to address this. Family members accompanying the patient, especially the dying patient, challenging to manage at the facility where isolation is run right through the facility and you need to be ready to accommodate these family members in a separate area and have a debriefing session with them. We changed the facility converted it to examination couches. We implemented basic furniture at each of the beds and additional equipment to be ready to manage the patients. You can see here a basic tool that we use shoe bags 
right through the facility. This is for syringes and needles hanging at the, at the head of every bed. There's a critical care area of five patients, which we're now increasing to seven patients due to certain unique circumstances in this metropolitan area. Um, this is what the, the layout looks like. And you can see still it's a factory. And then the structures were placed within the factory to accommodate the patients. Glass paneling make it possible to administer high flow nasal oxygen and protecting the staff from the aerosols in the process. This lady was, uh, the, sorry, going back to this facility, this critical care area was designed to accommodate patients we deteriorate in the field hospital until they are then transferred to either a private hospital or the government hospitals for admission. Due to various uh, unique circumstances in this uh, province, or specifically in this metropon, the hospitals is really, let's call it not functioning. And there was real needs to address this through interventions. Um, these patients de uh, desaturated very, very quickly. And on one evening, we had four of them desaturating within about 20 or 30 minutes. And we moved them into this area, put them on high flow nasal oxygen. And at the end, they were all showing us thumbs up within two days afterwards as they improved. Critical, keep in mind these patients deteriorate very, very quickly. They desaturate very, very quickly. You must be ready to react and, and capable to manage them. This is the, and one of the patients in this area as well. You can see a standard layout of this within the factory to accommodate critical care capabilities. What have we learned? Sluice facilities, something we don't think about. It was built quite a distance away from here. So you have a relay rally with bedpans between the sluice and the patients to address the situation. Portable x-ray or ultrasound units wasn't planned. It was found to be really critical essential, especially to determine progression of the pneumonia. Then high concentration oxygen buildup in these areas remains a very high risk. And especially where you've got a lot of these units in a, in a small space, there is a very high risk of the oxygen concentration reaching a very high level. If there's then a spark, you're going to see a challenging situation. So fire prevention is a critical component and then opening air uh, flow to ensure that you don't have a buildup of oxygen is critically important. We check this and we meeting this requirements at the moment, be very careful with a lot of high flow nasal oxygens in a small space uh, within the hospitals. We have a priority two area of 202 beds. This is what it looks like. And again, very standard hospital uh, layout, but there are certain challenges that I will highlight to you. Um, they specifically go for very basic beds. These beds can all go into a Fowler's position so they can lift the shoulders of the patient. There you can see a Fowler's position. They're also wide enough that you can prone the patients. So we prone them in these beds very easily and they far less expensive than the high low electrical beds that some other provinces were using in the field hospital facilities. And still these beds are quite effective for managing the patients. Oxygen supply is available at all the beds right through the facility. Electricity is available at all the beds, but you can see the challenges of possessions that I spoke about that came with the patients into the facility. What have we learned? Record keeping. Look carefully at your record keeping system and the management of files and paper. I know that in quite a few of the hospitals, you are paperless and that's a real advantage. We're picking up a very high positive rate amongst the data captures. And the only uh, conclusion we can come to is that that is the result of managing the files and capturing the data. Be careful. Patients' possessions I highlighted. Then a palliative care area. When this hospital was planned, they had the idea they're going to save everybody and there was no specific palliative care area identified. 
We had to create that within the facility by retrofitting certain areas, ensuring that we've got a palliative care area where support is available, oxygen is still available. I don't want a patient dying, gasping like a goldfish. So we really provide oxygen at these, these facilities and then nursing care to keep these patients comfortable and then uh, uh, manage the body afterwards. Big challenge is family members prepare for a lot of pa patients, family members that want to, to be with their patients, with their family members, which you can't allow, but accommodate them in a venue and arrange for debriefing of those people. Then a priority three area, we've got 1,485 beds. This make this hospital the biggest hospital in the area and about two thirds of uh, Paraguana. So this is what that looks like. And you can see the basic layout as I highlighted, it's a factory that has been converted into a space for patient care. Each of the wards are color coded and marked as such, and then walled in with a um, low wall so that observation of patients is possible right through the facility. This is what it looks like. You can see the covering for the debris that's falling from the roof, um, addressing the needs in this facility. What have we learned? Temperature control in a facility like this is not possible. Uh, we had wonderful ideas, people coming to say we must install underfloor heating. Now, I don't think if, if anybody can just imagine the operation to install underfloor heating in a facility like this. Then one bright spark came with the idea we should provide gas heaters in a high flow nasal oxygen environment. Um, no. Then there was those great ideas of putting electrical blankets on the beds. Um, no. So basically at the end, it comes down to basic things and blankets to keep the patients warm in these facilities. Distances from ablution, whenever you plan facilities like this, keep the distance from ablutions into account. In the middle of the night, the patient don't want to get out of his bed and walk right through this total facility to go to the ablutions. So we find that patients start urinating against the pillars, behind the walls, and those type of things resulting in quite a challenging situation. So plan your ablutions closer to the beds within reach of walking patients. Then something that we introduced at this facility, um, retrofitting um, in Sierra Leone, we had similar situations and then the patients don't want to undress in this open areas in public, especially the patients which are mobile and corpus mentis. The result is they all go into the toilets to, to change and uh, resulting in absolute blocking all spaces with people changing their clothes. So we need to we plan change rooms for the purpose so that the people can change in privacy, but not blocking the um, um, toilet ablution facilities. Then the position of nursing stations and where your nurses are based in these facilities. It is critically important to realize, and we see that a lot in various other field hospitals in the world that nurses develop really a breathing fatigue by walking this long distances with an N95 mask on uh, doing rounds. So bringing the nursing stations closer to the beds so that there are more stations and less distance for the staff to walk, address the, nurse, the breathing fatigue situation of the staff. We address the problem of the cold area and the cement floors by placing space blankets underneath all the beds between the mattress and the bed. And you won't believe the difference that that made for the patients in this facility. This is the change rooms that we created for the patients to go and change um, and if they don't want to do that in public. Ablution facilities, uh, some challenges managing that, but still a working solution. Then what lessons have we learned? <clears throat> you need control officers checking on the ablution facilities. 
when there's only a few ablution facilities and 1,400 patients, nobody accept responsibility for it and you see a mess. So having control officers there, checking the people going into the ablutions and making sure that they remain clean is really sounding very, very basic, but absolutely essential. Decontamination between the use of toilets, accessibility of wheelchairs, and then oxygen supply in the toilets. This may look absolutely ridiculous to you. We found that the patients was breathless by the time they reached the toilet, and then they sit like a goldfish on the toilet gasping for air. So we at the end had to supply oxygen in the toilets for the patients while they are using the toilets. Some remarks in closing on the support services, kitchen services, providing food to such a large number of patients, challenging situation, hygiene control, especially important if you've got an outbreak of any communicable disease or, or contamination of the food. You can just remember if you're sitting with 1,700 patients, what will be the result. So hygiene control, absolute essential. Inspection by the environmental health people, daily, absolutely essential. Be very careful on the sources that provide the food. It's quite often a company which is not recognizable, somebody's house, and it comes from somebody's uh, not so hygienic circumstances into this hygiene kitchen, and the end result is catastrophic. The patients were not comfortable for eating on their beds, so we need to address that. And secondly, as most of the patients is from a lower economic class and there was quite substantial food uh, provided to them, we find that they're all starting storing leftover foods in the lockers, uh, next to their beds, etc., that they want to take home when they are discharged, bringing all the challenges that you can think about in managing that type of situation. X-rays, we provided the mobile X-ray unit for the facility, and that is providing chest X-rays of all the patients in the facility, and then very specifically monitoring progress. And if you look at the one reports from, from China, that was seen as the best indicator when to move patients from a field hospital to a regular hospital uh, based on the x-ray findings on every second day situation. Plan these for ramps for wheelchairs. The trucks that we got there didn't have a ramp originally. We had to add that. Unique cleaning requirements for x-ray equipment. They don't go well with, with all the chlorine. So you need to plan that. And then oxygen in the x-ray unit was also absolutely essential. Our oxygen plant for the field hospital, providing all of those beds with oxygen, well functioning, the, we now planning additional beds with oxygen and then utilizing disaster manifolds for distributing oxygen to more than, than one bed and not individualized oxygen outlets due to the cost and that we cannot predict if we're going to need all those beds. We're currently busy providing oxygen for this part of the hospital as well. Few infection control challenges, overutilization of PPE, people walking around with double to triple masks resulting in breathing fatigue, not doing hand washing, flow of people between different areas, socializing between groups, very big challenge. Telephones and keyboards and controlling infection control on those with, between the staff members is really a challenge. We're providing wipes with all the telephones and keyboards and insisted everybody wipes the telephone before and after use. I highlighted the importance of color coding and the flow of the facility. We mark the total facility with posters. Can't enter if you haven't got that in place. You can't enter that area if you don't have that in place. And if you exit, you do all of that, ensuring that we enforce control of the use of PPE and the correct doffing and donning processes. Then something that we introduced after some assessment of the facility is decontamination stations. This is a temporary facility. There's not a lot of hand wash patients. So we implemented sanitation lines, red lines on the floor. And we've got a patrol person here that I'll speak about in a few minutes 
and you're not allowed to cross this line if you don't wipe down everything that you're carrying and sanitize your hands. And that is really measures to prevent contamination of items being carried backward and forth and then hand contamination. There you can see staff utilizing the decontamination station. Um, this is a typical decontamination station, wiping down the items. And this was uh, also for the ambulance people to mop the ambulance if they deliver a patient to the facility. We've got a lot of community health workers, which we specifically trained in home nursing as an additional skill for this purpose. And we're utilizing a, a group of them every day as the so-called infection control police providing them with a yellow jacket and all that they do is checking that you wash your hands, checking that you don't cross the line without sanitize, sanitizing your hands and checking on the ablution facilities all the time. Becoming a very active force and it's not a cost in terms of uh, action to do. We contaminated large component or large, let's say a lot of items in the facility with uh, ultraviolet sensitive spray and then gave all of these um, infection control police a ultraviolet torch and all that they do is checking hands, checking masks and you can see the contamination and contamination and if you show the people this they realize that they really at risk and they start washing their hands and uh, adhering to the protocols. Management, last few words on management remove the management from the risk area. Do not place the management of the hospital close to a risk area. Cocoon them to ensure that your management remain healthy and they can continue delivering care. We also, for the size of this facility, have a shadow management team that have no direct contact with the, the real management team so that if any of the managers do become positive and need to go into isolation, we have a shadow that can take over that function and keep on running the facility. Various tools available. We have a full set of action plans to address this situation. For those of you that have done MIMS with Mandy and the team, you can see CSCAT there as the guidance for all these action plans. And there are action plans how to set up the facilities, how to run facilities, and how to treat patients and how to transport patients. Addressing the different color zones, command structures, bed statistics, safety, communication, and the, keeping staff informed on what is happening in the facility, especially the positive messages, how many patients are discharged from the facility. Assessing the needs, decontamination, how to calculate surge capacity, uh, and what is the requirements therefore? Triage, then treatment and treatment protocols, also for field hospital facilities, and then transport capabilities. That's an overview of the search strategy of the country, the challenges that we are facing countrywide to address COVID and the measures that we are taking. Um, one take home message, the outbreak is not over and we're still going to see a lot of patients in the country. Secondly, oxygen, big challenge in providing oxygen, especially with the introduction of high flow nasal oxygen, which increased the use of oxygen dramatically at the hospitals. Please help us to get cylinders back to the, the uh, suppliers to be refilled. And in the field hospital, if you set up facilities like this, I try to highlight the lessons to keep in mind that we don't think about when one's planning these type of facilities. If there are any questions, I would gladly answer the questions. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's Mandy, I'll put this one question from Kaleem. Um, can you please clarify the concept of decanting? Okay, in, in uh, Mandy, thank you very much. The decanting process starts by first stopping the process of elective procedures, then uh, an analyzing the impact thereof, then stopping new admissions to the facility, then continue down the line with movement of patients to lower levels of care 
and discharge of patients. So that's basically a phased approach to really get the, the patient load in the hospital uh, decreased to make more beds available for patients coming in. Did that answer that, Mandy? Yeah, that answers it for me. I hope that answers it for you, Jolene. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Was it that boring? No, um, there's been quite a lot of good comments uh, on the side. Excellent talk, great talk. Thank you, great talk. I don't think anyone's ever been bored when you talk here. <laughs> so there's a question here. Uh, no, I cannot imagine the effort to put in such a fucking place is constant. I don't see Are you any hands. the comments, Sia? Sorry, uh, yes, I saw the, com the comments, okay. Mandy. Thank you. Chris, are you there? Yes, Mandy, I am. Uh, yeah, I just want to just echo, I think that was a brilliant talk. Uh, I think it's great to get a perspective on kind of such a high level, or from such, sorry, so, so high level. The, I'm not sure if this is a question, and Ryan, maybe you can just clarify it. You say, this certainly does require enormous amounts of planning. You only depicted one field hospital. Are there enough people? Is that to ask, are there enough people for us to implement uh, these sort of plans? Thank you very much, Chris. I think it's an ex excellent question. And I know NetCare is very, very cross with, with the government because a lot of staff left. I think a uh, big challenge is HR, HR provision in providing these type of facilities. I think the biggest challenge lies that the National Department of Health calculated what will be the, the, the requirement for staff, uh, but not calculated what is the sources available in the country and how many staff members are already employed in, in, the, in the country. So at the end, we find that all of the facilities, and that's right through the country, and we're listening to a province per day and their feedback, they're going to recruit 70 registered nurses, 224 intensivists, 975 enrolled nurses, and 850 auxiliary nurses. And they go down that type of, 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 of uh, um, figures, and there is not that number of people available in the country. So the only way you can address this is to widen the scope of staff members, widen the span of control of staff members, and utilizing other healthcare professions and lower care personnel under supervision to provide care. So in this field hospital facilities, we've got for each of those rows of beds, we've got one registered nurse, but then she's supported by approximately five enrolled nurses, but then she's got a vast number of uh, home-based nurses underneath her to provide care. And really it is a challenge for the registered nurse to take the responsibility for all of that, uh, but it really provides a solution. The second part is in the critical care environment where you have one intensivist taking overall charge of the facility and then medical officers under guidance to provide the care and assist with, with the care. So I think we need to think outside the block, the box and get out of the, our regular thinking. Then we mustn't forget about all the other groupings. There are still a lot of occupational therapists sitting there filing their nails at the current moment that one can utilize. Um, they are the dental people, the veterinary people, and those people are really, which we're starting to pull now in certain provinces into the hospitals to come and assist in the care because you cannot just rely on or, or depend on the standard categories of nursing and medical staff that we've, we've got in the country. Yeah, don't forget the clinical associates, right? Yes, yes, very, very important. Very, Large very number important. of unemployed clinical associates. Yeah, and 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 even the BACs. There, we found that we can use a lot of the basic ambulance uh, course qualified people that are unemployed currently that we get in through the the extended works program and providing them with an opportunity to assist with a lot of these activities and then also. Uh, supplementing the EMS uh, groupings by providing uh, additional drivers for the ambulances so that you can utilize your higher skilled personnel to render care. 
Okay, Sarah, so Bernard Siegel asked you a question on how do you achieve communal cleaning and what systems are you using to achieve this in field hospitals? Okay, thank you very much, Mandy. Also a good question. Challenging situation, that, that current facilities that you see there, we physically mop them. It's the only real uh, uh, situation. So they get uh, wet sweep and then mopped down and that's the only way they can really be effectively cleaned. The, the unf uneven floor surfaces, et cetera, make it non-ideal for any other type of, 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 of apparatuses. And old Prof. Shaheen Metar is not very happy with all the funny machines that is going to do this. So currently all the field hospitals in the country is cleaned manually through wet mopping of all the areas. Thanks, Pierre. There's one here from uh, uh, Jossie. Is Hagley perhaps overprovided for this pandemic at the cost of general medical care? Sorry, Mandy, I couldn't hear that. Have we perhaps overprovided for this pandemic at the cost of general medical care? Okay, I think that's a, that's a very valid statement. I highlighted right at the beginning that I think a big mistake was that there was instructions given to decant hospitals much ease, earlier to stop elective work much easier, earlier than what was really necessary. So that should have been able to, con to continue and alleviate the backlog. The second part is very careful assessment. And this is where I come in with the 65% of beds. In certain areas, we really had to keep patients in the hospitals and make sure that we don't go the British route of decanting the patients into care facilities and thereby spreading the disease into the care facilities. So careful assessment of patients in the facilities uh, before discharge remains essential. And I do think that in certain areas, we definitely over planned for this. And a lot of hospitals has gone to the extreme of shutting down because there was now one positive case in the hospital and resulting in a, a challenge with the care for other patients. And I think we're going to see exactly what we saw in Sierra Leone, that we see a drop in the general health status of the population following this situation. We already see a decrease in patients uh, collecting their medicine, especially the HIV positive patients. We already see a decrease in the patients uh, meeting their uh, appointments and collecting their medicine out of fear of contracting the disease, which one can also understand. But I think we need to be very careful that we don't throw the baby with the bathwater and have a total drop in our health status in the country. Thanks, Theo. From Rob Ferreira, when you speak about oxygen shortages in the Northern and Eastern Cape, may I ask you to be more specific? I'm concerned about bottles lying around that could be more productive, home use, et cetera. Okay, I think what, uh, what is really a challenge is that of all the oxygen cylinders in the country at any moment in time, only about a third are really in use. Two thirds are in the transit process and the refilling process. So if they are stuck in storerooms or at, at hospitals to be collected or not sent in for refilling, uh, they are kept out of the, the, the system. And therefore, we find that there's now a shortage of bottles to supply certain hospitals with oxygen because they just couldn't keep up filling and flow to the facilities. There's not enough bottles. So all that we're urging, please, if there are cylinders lying at hospitals from the two main suppliers, Liquid Air and Afrox, um, and they're not your cylinders or what have you, please contact the, the company to come and collect because they are in urgent need of cylinders. Okay, so Jolene wants to know how, um, oh, Candice, how was the sluicing issue sorted? Just say again, Mandy. How did you sort, how did you sort the, sluice, the sluice room problem? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a challenging one. We, we, we couldn't bring a sluice closer to the facilities because of the sewage system in the area. We ended off by using extensive use of plastic bags and putting the bedpans in a plastic bag and then take them all the way to the sluice, uh, clean and emptying uh, in the facility. 
uh, the challenge was really laid out and we couldn't solve the problem uh, in, in any other way by uh, placing the used bed pans in a sealed plastic bag and then taking them through to, to the sushi room facility. And then from Jolene again, thanks to you. How will all these extra people be remunerated? Or was it on a pro bono basis? So did you employ all the staff at the field hospital? Or is there a large volunteer basis? No, the, the volunteer basis is, is really a, a non-existing uh, entity. There was uh, a start in the Western Cape to start with volunteers and they built up a database of everybody that started volunteering and the moment they caught on them this one had this excuse and that one had that excuse so at the end all of the staff is employed and they are paid within the, the provincial services they are carried against vacant posts of various hospitals that are being grouped together and they are uh, therefore appointed in the government service on short-term contracts and paid according to the government salaries. Then there are the so-called extended works program, which is a program where they take unemployed people in and pay them a stipend. And they are then utilized in various roles in the facility uh, through that uh, uh, paid stipend. There are really no volunteers in any of the field hospitals except for a few here and there in, in the social support environment and in the religious support environment, but in the clinical care environment, I haven't found any real volunteers that do this pro bono at any of the hospitals so far. Thanks, Theo. I know we're over time. There were really just two questions and I really don't want anyone to post any more. Um, Ryan asks, I meant, who does the planning? Surely you, could, you cannot visit every field hospital. As presented, it requires a bit of thinking. And then the last one was, uh, how did you provide privacy? Did you install mobile bed screens to ensure privacy between patients or was privacy a big issue? Yeah, no, privacy is provided through mobile bed screen, those famous trippers that everybody fall over. So they are an extensive uh, uh, use in the facilities to provide privacy. I highlighted the change rooms to try and achieve privacy in the process. Uh, you cannot achieve absolute privacy in the facilities, unfortunately not. Um, so that, that is a challenge. I think, um, and going back to the first question on design, I think very important whenever one gets confronted with such a situation like this, please read widely before you start building. There's a lot of literature available. We now publish these action plans, which is not the Alpha and Omega, but they gave some guidelines, but there is in the literature, excellent publications on setting up temporary hospitals. Um, they are available, they can be free, download, especially the International Red Cross has got an excellent manual that you can download for free. Uh, these action plans are available for free. If anybody wants them, they can send me an email and I'll send them the full set of action plans. Um, and at the back of each of the action plans, there are links to these facility, to these sources that you can utilize. There's also from the World Health Organization, an excellent publication that you can download. The challenge with all of this was that these facilities was planned, unfortunately, not always taking into account uh, clinical knowledge or bringing in people that have worked in medical wards and asking their advice on what will be the requirements. So I think the biggest uh, advice is read widely and really get the people that normally work in the medical wards to come and look at your layouts and talk uh, uh, to the, the architects before you start building these facilities. We had one facility which was designed by a paramedic. Now I've, I'm also in the EMS environment and also qualified in that area, so I'm not belittling them, but I don't think that a paramedic has got the background to design a field hospital. So I think bring in the people that have worked in hospitals, utilize their experience and read widely. That's my advice. Thanks, Chris, you want to close? Sure, thanks, Mandy. Uh, Thea, thank you again. I think that was a brilliant session uh, and kind of really informative. I think this is a lot of work that Mandy's driven in NetCare 
Uh, but I think for those that aren't part of the normal NetKey environment or the internal operations, stuff that is very new and, and probably not that we would have just seen before. So thank you. That, that was a great session. Uh, Mandy, you have to remind me what next week's uh, schedule is? I think it's Prof. Wolfhard on the uh, polytrauma and COVID. That's correct. Yeah. So, so our next session will be Monday night. Uh, and from next week onwards, we're going to do Monday and Wednesday. Uh, we'll see how the rest of the month goes, and then we can decide uh, what we'll do from September onwards, uh, and, and if we can keep this going in a different format, perhaps, and maybe look into some non covid topics as well. Uh, but otherwise, thank you again, Theo. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Have a good evening, and we'll see you again on Monday night. Thanks, Theo. Thank you.